Now then, how are you doing? Hi. How's it going? This is my friend, the fire extinguisher. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Found a bit uh, of room. Yeah, it's all about my time changing. No, that's all right. Chaos. No, it's all right. I've got my boy off to sleep about quarter past seven, so it's everything, anything after that's all right. So you've got little ones as well. Okay, I've got two. That's right, my, right. My, my plans just go all over the place. I've come to the studio, so it's like an hour and a half drive. Oh, blimey. I can't do this at home because they'll be like, mummy, mummy, mummy. So, yeah. An hour I'm and a half? With, yeah, I'm sat in my studio <laughs> <with> my doors. <laughs> I've got, look, the toilet over there. I've got fire extinguisher here. <laughs> it's all glamour. Is it, like, video? Are people going to see this? Yeah, if that's all right, yeah. Yeah, I need to move the fire extinguisher then. Or... Nah, it's all right. It's no difference to me <laughs> <laughs> i've got a picture of the suffragettes look <laughs> well i used to be in the suffragettes oh uh, cool that's next to me but i, I don't uh, can i do this I sit here. oh no hang on <laughs> wait <laughs> bear with we <We're> got <laughs> uh, this is no good is it no honestly that's all right you got a little statue in the background looks a bit Quirky. <laughs> I've got yeah, I've got Elvis over there. <laughs> That'll do, yeah. <laughs> no, I'll um, go no bother, honestly. All right, look, <clears throat> cross-legged on the floor. So it's not <laughs> it's very 2004, to be fair. <laughs> oh, isn't it? <laughs> well, I've been listening to loads of your uh, guests. All uh, right, Charlotte on the way here. It's great. Oh, right. Subways, yeah. Did is for the way home, yeah. Did's uh, Cooper's is for the way home. I had Patrick the other day. It's great. <laughs> it's, um, he also like listening to Patrick. Then have you kept in touch with him and stuff? Yeah, we. I haven't seen him. Um, but it's that long. Uh, years. How long have I been here? Maybe eight years. I haven't actually seen him. Um, but I'm like. I just won't go away <laughs> so I constantly text him I was texting him yesterday I thought I went to see the libs on Friday and I, I texted him in case there was a chance that he was going but yeah we talk but I'm not gonna leave it I want that hug <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah where was Liberty was yeah. that in is it Camden they're playing or something at uh, the forum yeah in Kentish Town uh, okay it really is. yeah ah, nice one yeah so you're obviously on good terms with Pete then and stuff yeah, yeah. Again, he, I haven't spoken to him in a long time as well. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was it, nothing was ever. There was no bad feeling. I, I can't really have any bad feelings for anyone. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, fair. Um, and then in terms of what you're doing, like you say you're a studio, like what's the crack with that? Again, again. <laughs> I'm so happy. No, I'm yeah, I'm in a new band. We're called JW Paris. Um, yeah, and it's great. And we're we've just uh, finished a tour last week, and we're going on tour again on Friday. Um, it's great. Albums out this summer, I think. We've got a single on the 25th of March. It's all exciting, and I'm like it's full of way too much excitement to be playing again. And uh, yeah, it's been like. A year now I've been in the band and it's brilliant. Uh, nice one. <laughs> I definitely will do. Is it like an up and down the country kind of thing? The song? Yeah, we did. Um, last week was a, a, a an amazing project. I think it's fantastic actually. But um, it's called Leave the Capital. So it's by um, a big collab collaboration of uh, Blaggers Records, um, Transmission um radio um blender i think the radio as well and vandalism begins at home but they're all based um in like the home counties so beds bucks um northampton that circle and they took four bands uh on tour we did a, a five day actually no it's not five we're playing six we've done yeah we've done six um but there's another one um on friday that we can't do because we're on tour with the skinner brothers but um and a vinyl was released so any vinyl collectors out there there's a really swanky new vinyl out <laughs> but it's called leave the capital and we went to um 
Stoke, uh, Liverpool, um, brain blank, Brighton, uh, Bedford, Milton Keynes. And then, yeah, on Friday, we're with the Skinner Brothers, Skinner Brothers, and we're doing okay. Preston, Norwich, Brighton. So this is really sorting my brain out here. Exeter, Bedford. So, oh, yeah, it's busy. <laughs> Preston to Exeter, that's quite a... Yeah, that's quite a bit shift. of me. I'm the driver, <laughs> so... Oh, <right. laughs> yeah, it's um, great. Though. I love it. Yeah, I was going to say, is it kind of like exciting as it ever was, really? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I should be really cynical because um, <laughs> I've done this so many times, but I just love it. I love it. Being in the van, just me and the two boys, we have such a laugh. It's probably like equals with the buzz of being on stage is uh, the time in the van. We just have such a laugh. It's brilliant. <laughs> So yeah, like a four-hour drive to Preston is. Uh, I'm kind of looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, especially when you've got uh, a couple of kids. As much as you love them, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I love my girls. I really love my girls, but I really love my boys as well in the band. <laughs> I like two times, two two worlds, two lives. It's great. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's a bit of time off. Yeah. Right. Um, if we take it back a bit, then Gemma, like. Yeah, no worries. You mentioned the suffragettes and everything. Like, what was kind of the build up to you being in baby shambles, basically? Yeah? Okay, so a long story to shorten it. <laughs> um, the suffragettes was a band that I started with my um, primary school bestie. Um, we were friends when we were seven years old, um, and she could play a bit of guitar. I just, I couldn't play anything, but I just wanted to be a bass player. I was a bit obsessed with Sid Vicious and thought that that's, that's for me. I like that. <laughs> the attitude, uh, low slung bass. Um, my dad, uh, the family business is a rehearsal studios for bands. Um, and he tour managed a lot of the bands in the nineties. So I grew up around music and bands and that whole London scene um, of all the Britpop pop stuff. Um, so yeah, we just would, the studios was our playground. So after school um, and weekends, we would just be here crashing, making God awful noises in the studio, thinking that like we were like really good writing these amazing songs. Um, but we got some pretty good little tunes together when we was about 15. Um, we toured, like my dad would sling us in the back of the van and we'd go off in our summer holidays and half terms and we'd tour in, uh half terms and stuff um we were signed when we were like 17 young we was young big deal with sony um tours recording you name it like all the exciting stuff and um so yeah i was at the studio busy with the suffragettes and uh the libertines uh pete and carl had been in and out of ruse our studio um forever they they were one of our regulars um the suffragettes toured with a band called elvis with two s's which was where i met drew drew was a bit of a punk you know spiky hair and bondage trousers amazing um, and his band were like skate punk the suffragettes loved them and we had a, a wicked tour um drew was in another band at ruse down the corridor patrick also worked at the reception at Ruse and was in another band. He did a session for uh, Peter on the first single, Baby Shambles, like self-titled. And one night, because I knew him really well, he was like my big brother, rang me one night, it was about two o'clock in the morning. And he was like, Jam, you gonna come for a jam with me and Pete? I was like, yeah, not now though, it's two o'clock in the morning, I'm in bed. And he was like, no, come now. So I did, I got up and went and knocked on my dad's door and I was like, mom, dad, Pete want, uh, Patrick wants me to go jam with Pete. And my dad is a muso. He went, well, go on then. <laughs> oh, okay. So I picked up my stick bag, which was my spare stuff at home. And off I toddled to this um, back street in Bethnal Green. Um, and knocked on this like big scary like door in this cobbled alleyway and a door opened they were like who are you i was like hi 
was like 19 or sort of 20. It's like, hello, I'm Gemma, come to my job. <laughs> <laughs> I used to look like a smurf or something, hello. Um, and yeah, I was let in and Peter and Patrick were out the back with the Parrot Brothers jamming. And that was kind of it. There was never, do you want to join a band? Do you, there was never, do you want to play a gig? It was not, this is a new project. That was a jam. And we jammed for a few hours. I was scrabbling to catch up and learn parts that they were all playing. It was just a crazy jam. Um, the next morning, they rang me again and we rehearsed again at Ruse. Um, and this was before the days of social media. Um, Patrick, no, Peter had uh, his fan forum and put it out on his forum. Why doesn't everyone come and watch our rehearsal? <laughs> <laughs> And within about half an hour, there was about a hundred people queuing around the block to get into our little rehearsal studio. <laughs> so they let them in as many as we could pack in. And we played the four songs that we had cobbled together three times. <laughs> we did one, two, three, four, uh, again, one, two, three, four. It was, it was really good fun, chaos, but the whole of that year was the same. There was never, right, this is our band, let's rehearse, let's, what should we do? You know, it was just, got a gig tomorrow, do you want it? Got a tour next week, we're gonna go recording. You know, oh, I loved it though, it was great, it was great. <laughs> yeah, that's what Patrick was saying is like, you turn it to a gig and Pete would be like, right, we're playing this and none of you had played it before or something. Oh, all the time. <laughs> That was so Patrick and I love a rehearsal. So we like to talk before every not every gig, but the early gigs, especially when Peter would throw us a song like that. I'd say, Oh, can you tell me when the verse ends? Tell me when we're going into the chorus. Cue me, count me in. You know, I was just <laughs> the big one was um Radio X or XFM. We did a, a session, and on the day, Peter decided that we was gonna jam a new song. And what went out on the radio is almost verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, verse, chorus. When I listen to it now, I can hear the point where we all got stuck and couldn't get out because <laughs> it was live on air. Like, what? 32nd of December, I think that went on to be an album track. Okay. <laughs> Why is that on YouTube? It was at the time. Oh, no. Um, yeah, it is because it's a radio it? session. So it wasn't, it's not a, like a, a video, but the audio is on there. Oh, it sounds listen. really good, but. If you could see us, I was like in the little drum room, like frantically, you know, eyeballs. Like, what, what are we doing? How do we stop this? <laughs> it's like a 45 minute song because we're stuck. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what in terms of your other band then? Are you able to like carry on with that or do you have to make a decision at some point? Yeah, oh, that was such a traumatic time in this, like an emotional time for me because... The Suffragettes had been, it was my only band. I had never, ever, ever played my drums without Alex there. And I look over there because there's a picture of us right there. Um, she was always on my left. And suddenly I'd gone for this jam and it was okay. And then we did that rehearsal gig and then we did another two gigs and the girls, they all came to watch. And I remember feeling really torn because we were kind of not metal, but rock you know and the libertines were huge and they this indie scene was massive that they had created and suddenly i stepped out of my little world my camp and i'm over here with like the king of indie in the polar opposite you know i'm playing the music style was opposite i'd never played without alex there um and i had because there was never a do you want to be in this band I never felt the time to say, you know, make a choice. I was just playing with this band for now. I didn't know how long it was going to be or what was going to happen tomorrow. Maybe they, you know, they would put, get a new drummer in tomorrow. I never had any idea. But um, I had a chat with Alex and I said, I need to give this the time that it may need. And I remember saying, I don't know how long this is going to be it could be five years it could be 
a day. I don't know, <laughs> but we need you to give me that time. And, and we did. We didn't shelve the suffragettes. Um, we just took a little hiatus, if that's the right word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, did, um, I had a few weeks where we had some big commitments to fulfill. And I was rehearsing upstairs with the suffragettes and downstairs with shambles and running between the two. And I was just like, <laughs> this cannot go on. Like, I can't do this. Um, so, yeah, as soon as, as I left shambles, within a month or something, Alex and I were back up and, and running again and the suffragettes picked up where we'd left off. I mean, it was a year later, but <laughs> yeah, we, I'd, we still got a good few years out of the suffragettes after shambles. Oh, nice one. Hiatus. <laughs> yeah, it's quite like an ideal scenario, really, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> bit of Although, a second, yeah. would you call it now? Yeah, what, yeah, I don't even know what I, I like to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <fair> enough. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you mentioned that original lineup then for that like rehearsal studio gig, whatever. So it was you, Patrick, and the Perrot brothers, and Pete and Peter. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, so five of us. Right, okay. brothers are incredible, incredible players. Um, and there was a few times that I really did feel quite out of my depth because I was like, I had, my hair was dyed pink. I had, I was a bit of a, not metaler, but skate punk. And I, I was like, I need to have a bit of an identity change here. <laughs> you know, I just put a flat cap on and some straight leg jeans rather than huge baggy skate jeans. Um, and I, I just got on well, so well with Jamie and Peter, they were called. But they left quite early on and Patrick yeah. said, no, it's just us three. We'll do it. And I remember saying to him, are you sure? <laughs> Peter, not a bit, to wayward with a guitar as well. And just me and you, him on bass and me on drums. And uh, I was racking my brains. And I remembered touring with Drew down the corridor he was at that point. And I remember saying to Patrick, let me go and get Drew in for a jam because he's a wicked bass player and he's solid. Like, cause I'm a drummer, we have to work together. And he, he needs to be my mate first and foremost. <laughs> and he was. So, and Patrick and Peter were like, no, let's just be a free piece. And I could just, I needed someone else a bit more solid on stage for me. So yeah, I went, run down the corridor, banged on the door, Drew, come in here and have a jam. And he was like, yeah okay you know <laughs> and it, again it just sort of went from there there was never any discussion of like right this is our band it was like we've got a gig tomorrow Jamie and Peter aren't doing it so we need a new bass player Drew you're are you up for it <laughs> <laughs> that was about it <laughs> I kind of liked that chaosness though I did I did <laughs> yeah I think and even as just a fan that's what kind of made it exciting you didn't know what was going to happen one day to the next kind yeah, of yeah not just as a fan <laughs> yeah, <laughs> as yeah. Fans, nobody knew <laughs> <laughs> um there's like I was obviously like we had to foresee like drew staying in it for 10 years i guess he went through it thick and thin didn't he pretty much yeah yeah like yeah drew's very quiet so i think he he just rode the waves chill do you know what I mean? It was just chill. <laughs> just chill. And uh, after it, I heard um, Patrick's interview with you, and um, I had no idea that he went through what he did after I left the band. It was, yeah, it really choked me up listening to that because he's like my big brother and I adore him. And obviously, I wasn't an idiot. I knew what was going on on tour. That was the main reason that I couldn't hack it anymore. But it's horrible. It was horrible listening to how bad he had got with it. Do you know what I mean? And how he felt. And he feels great now and he's doing great. And that's why when I heard that, I was like, right, text. <laughs> Come on. I want to see you. So, yeah, it was, um, I would never have thought that Drew would have stayed for 10 years. But now I understand why. He's chill. Like I said, he just ride the waves, go with the yeah. flow. <laughs> And I bet, um, like, the stuff he's doing with Liam Gallagher, it's a walk in the park now. For him. Yeah, I mean, anything is now. Yeah. <laughs> you know what, though, having said that, I worked with Adam Ann um, for about six or eight months um, 
after I'd worked with Peter, not directly after, but quite a few years after. And uh, I remember my mum and dad saying, oh my God, a sad man, you know, he's, uh, well, how do you say? He, he's, he's reputation. Not, yeah, <laughs> yeah, he does. So I was like, ah, ah easy. I've worked with Pete Doherty, come on. <laughs> but no, no, Adam, Adam's pretty out there. <laughs> yeah. For, um, all right, let's go back to some questions. Uh, yeah, was there a bit of a, a crossover between the Libertines and Baby Shambles? Were you playing gigs where they turn into a Libertines? Gigs. Yeah, yeah, there were loads of songs that we used to play with this. <laughs> so what Katie did, I, I heard them do that the other night. I know it's a Libertine song. I knew it was a Libertine song. But listening to it, then playing it the other night, I was like, hey, we used to play this song. <laughs> it was, you know, our version is so, so different. Uh, I'm trying to think, but I think it was Don't Look Back Into The Sun that Peter used to like to play a lot. Um, and there's a huge drum roll, you know, that bit, <laughs> drum speak. <laughs> but I could never play that feel so quick. Um, so I used to just stand up and go, and all the fans would sing, shout it back at me, and then I could play the beat again. <laughs> just come back in on the beat. <laughs> <laughs> Good move, yeah. Yeah. I remember That's sitting in our studio, though, rehearsing when... Um, can't stand me now was in, a, in the charts and he was listening to it and Patrick and I caught eyes and I was like I've got to say this I was like you know you can go back to the Libertines like you don't have to stick with us like you, you're riding high like your single's massive at the moment you need to go to that and he was like no 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 because you know there was other things going on with them at the time but yeah that was a really awkward week or two well, I felt awkward. I don't think it was in the band. We were just like, right, look, rehearse, go, gig, whatever. But I did feel a bit awkward. Felt a bit like cheating, you know? Like his band is in the charts. They're, they're doing really well. And he's over here in a smelly van. <laughs> we're going to play probably a little tiny sweaty pub. I mean, it was still amazing. I loved it. But I did feel like I should have given him that option <laughs> to go back yeah. at that point. <laughs> yeah yeah but um yeah i was thinking about this recently do you think he kind of preferred being on the crazy side of things obviously libertines at that point were getting more kind of i don't know if polish is the right word but they were like major management major labels major venues do you think in a way pete kind of preferred what you guys are doing <laughs> I like to think so. <laughs> no, do you know what? Honestly, the, the way I do like to think of it is shambles started exactly that. It was an absolute shambles. It was a bit of a, a kickback from Peter, I think. Um, and it grew into this a totally different entity. I think we sounded different, we definitely looked different. And it was a little, a lot more chaotic. Like you say, Libertines were more slick then. I don't know. It wasn't anything that, again, that we'd set out to do. It just was so organic. <laughs> we were just what we were and it was never discussed. It just happened that way. And yeah, I like to think we were so different. It was not a lot of comparison. That's the word. Mm. Whether people agree with me or not, I don't know. But. <laughs> No, I think it was talking to another kid uh, about on social media, just saying how exciting that that year was, 2004. Just uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just really like a lot of fun, especially like with you guys, obviously. Um, Benchmark year in my life. And then, yeah, just some of the things you got up to. Like, yeah, obviously you mentioned radio, radio X, well XFM session, and. Uh, did he do the Zane Lowe one as well? Yeah, yeah, at Made of Bell Studios. So I always thought that was, well, I still think that's the best version of yeah. Book Forever Baby Sean was ever did, I think. Yeah, it was great. Better than the album version, I think, yeah. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love those recordings. I, I think they're great. Um, just a quick one. There's just someone with a door open. Is that, like, really ruining us? Uh, 
<laughs> Depends what they get up to. I can hear it a bit, yeah. For the sake of your editing, pause this. We're going down the corridor, all right? All right, cool. Nice one. <laughs> and I know, I, you know, I kept looking over. That's the boys in my band going into the studio. And they uh, okay, right, right. Open, and it's easier for me to move us down the corridor. Ah, oh, nice one. <laughs> Hang on. <gasps> Rock and roll life. <laughs> Is it the same studio you're on about earlier? Yeah, Ruth's. Oh, right, that's interesting. <laughs> My dad's place. Right, I need to shut that door and then I'll be back in. Okay. <laughs> the things we do. <sighs> Hello. Oh, nice one. <laughs> right, so. A lot better. Yeah, I can go further down there, but this is about as quiet as I can get. No, no, spot on, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, just talking about... Uh, yeah, playing Maid of Ill, I suppose. I wonder what they're made of. You lot rocking up there. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what, though? For me, the whole time, I, I was pinching myself because I'd, I'd been working so hard. It was like 10 years working with the suffragettes. And I, it wasn't even that long, actually, at that point. A long time. I'd worked really hard, and we couldn't break the mainstream. We were doing really well. Underground, the live scene, Kerrang, Metal Hammer. But to get to break the mainstream was just difficult, it was hard work. And suddenly, I'm in it, like I'm playing drums on a weekly basis at that point behind Peter, who's an old friend, but he's also king of indie. Like he, <laughs> his band started that whole massive scene. And yeah I, I still couldn't I was I couldn't believe the things that we were doing we did CD UK do you remember that yeah I saw on YouTube the other day yeah. I loved CD UK and when we turned up I was like oh my god it's CD UK and I was in the dressing room having makeup done next to Fern Cotton <laughs> what every single Saturday morning I've watched her on the telly and CD UK and here I am and then we did Top of the Pops like what Everything we did, even every single night that was sold out or there was a queue around the block or I, I was pinching myself. I could not believe that I was here. Like, is this even happening? Wow. Yeah, I, I just, I was well in, <laughs> well in for the ride. I loved it. It's great. <laughs> yeah, Top of the Pops is one we've talked about a few times, but yeah, it must be like mega in terms of like your family and stuff. Yeah. Like they must be loving it, yeah. But it, that was another one that was touch and go. Like we nearly didn't get to go on <laughs> because they do like a sound check run through. Um, and Pete had a bit of um, a skirmish with someone in the crowd. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we'd done our rehearsal, the skirmish had happened and we were like banished to our dressing room waiting for the live moment. Like, okay, now come down and now you do the song again. Um, and that they was questioning whether they were going to allow us to do that. <laughs> I was right. like, oh, come on now. So if you actually watch, um, what they did put out was our rehearsal. We didn't. Uh, right. it. So if you see it right at the beginning, I'm grinning at the camera because it was um, vocal to track. So the vocal was live, but we were all miming. We didn't know. I'd never heard that edit, the radio edit version of Kilimanjaro. So the drum middle eight is cut in half so no what the hell was going on <laughs> like wait what oh, chorus do you know what I mean and at the beginning you can see Drew and Pat talking to each other like something like I can't hear your guitar or it's mimed do you know what I mean it was all but but we were on it do you know what I mean I watch it now and like we did top of the props <laughs> yeah whether it's live or not or we knew it was happening or not we're on it <laughs> <laughs> there's a bit of a uh... Is it a bit of like a rent a car situation on top of the pops? It's not like it's not like genuine baby shambles fans, is it? Oh, no. no, there was about fifteen or twenty people there, um, <clears throat> and the the stages are in like a a cone, like a circle, and they the crowd and the camera just move round to each band that were playing. I can't remember who I was back to back with because the drummers are all up the top, and I remember someone being behind me, like, and he had this like really fancy kit and like a sound perspex screen around him and I remember thinking huh I haven't even got um pads on so you put pads on the kit so you can hit it 
but it doesn't make any sound. I didn't even have those. I remember thinking, I really missed something here. (laughs) (laughs) What the hell? He's got all these rubber symbols and the screen around. I'm going to have to try and remember who that was. I can't remember. (laughs) Yeah, a bit of homework for me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Then obviously just like kind of the mad tour when you were doing um, watching the Manchester gig on YouTube today, which is just like one of the best videos from that time, I think, in terms of music, uh, especially the baby shambles. Um, so people like, you know, like Dot Allison and Wolfman, like obviously all kinds of characters, like what was it like on tour, if you can sum it up? <laughs> <laughs> God, can you? Um, now that tour was um, September and it was about a month. I think we did like 30 odd dates. And we'd hit our stride then. I was comfortable in the songs and the set. I was ready if Peter was gonna throw another new one at me. I was like confident in my my playing and the set to say, no, you can do that song acoustic. <laughs> Cause he had his um, acoustic break with Dot. Um, it was great having Dot on tour as well. She and I got on so well. We played, um, so she used to sing for Massive Attack and Peter was late to one of the gigs. It was Nottingham Rock City. And he was late for our um, our gig. So I said, well, look, me and Drew opened the set anyway on our own. Let's go and just jam out the the intro for 10 minutes or something until he gets it. And uh, Dot said, oh, I'll go out and play another song because she'd already been out. And she she went out on her own and she's really little and she's got a really little voice. And she had like 2,000 bringing Shambles fans. She'd already been out. And her little voice, and she just started singing Teardrop. And I was like, I have to join her. So I just did. I just walked out and I was like, all right. <laughs> and then I had a big cheer. She was like, what are you doing? I was like, oh, I can play this. And I just played Teardrop, me and her. Oh, that was a moment. Wolfman as well is an absolute legend. I absolutely adore that man. We were talking again the other day and the song Wolfman was my favourite song. I love that. I love to play it um, because it was never the same twice. I love the big jam at the end. Um, And that was that was where I would make Patrick just play. (laughs) He used to turn around and go, I've had enough. No, solo some more. I loved it. But um, and yeah, so whenever Wolfman would come out, which wasn't every gig, but when he would come out on stage, Oh, my adrenaline boost for me. I love it. I loved it when he, the, the chemistry between Wolf and Pete was just magic. I love that song. Oh, yeah, that's a good memory. <laughs> yeah, some of those, like, early songs are really good. They never made it onto the, onto the first Clementine. album. But... Pardon? Yeah, Clementine. Yeah, and um, Man Who Came to Stay. Yeah. Oh, what um, a Do You Know Me? Some oh, really good yeah. songs, yeah. That was our set opener for for ages. Like, oh, oh yeah, Black Boy Lane. Yeah, uh, I loved Clementine. Uh, yeah, it's how lovely that he was mad that song. When it was like three different songs in one kind of thing. Yeah, the <laughs> other one that's like that is Gang of Gin. Like we used to tour that a lot, and I loved that one. But the verses were so fast. He used to turn around, play it faster. I'm like, <laughs> can't play any faster. <laughs> Oh, I love, yeah, that was a great set. We did have a really good set. Yeah, yeah. That man, that Manchester gig, uh, it's funny because it's just like Pete literally walks off the tour bus, presumably a bit late, yeah. and almost yeah. straight on stage. Uh, yeah. Is that kind of how it worked a little bit? Yeah, so I um, was quite well documented in NME for um, pretty much every tour. I would... Um, sit be in the downstairs lounge because you'd have two lounges one up one down and I'd always be in the downstairs lounge with my DVDs because that's where I would sit and watch put my pajamas on and watch my DVDs <laughs> sound like stuff <something> <laughs> but I only had two DVDs for the first tour which was Finding Nemo <laughs> and Motley Crue Greatest Hits so I would always have one of the two on I started to learn Finding Nemo word for word. So I would like obsessively watch it and watch it. But the crew would all be there with me. So like the runners and the agents and um, techs and roadies. And um, 
the boys would always be upstairs partying, whatever. They would still be partying when I would go to bed. So every morning on a tour, I would get up, I would go out with the, the crew and we'd have breakfast, have a look in the towns. Cause I, I you know, we're, we're touring the UK. Like I want to have a look. We went to Ireland for four days. We had a great time over there looking around. Then we would do the loading and sound checks. Sometimes Patrick would come in to sound check. Sometimes Patrick and Drew would come in to sound check. Peter never sound checked. And that was fine because that's how we did it, you know? Um, so the first time I would see him most days is as he walks on stage. So that's why a lot of the gigs, you always see me go, oh, hi, you know, <laughs> or he'll come over to the drums like, oh, all right, how you doing? You know, and then that would be our hello and the gig would begin. That yeah. was one that I remember, I had really bad flu that day. I woke up in the morning and I was like, I'm dying. <laughs> you know, when you've got the shivers and your bones hurt, and I remember staying, spending the whole day in my pyjamas watching my DVDs on the bus. I didn't even sound check that day. <laughs> and uh, I just felt like I was going to die. But I pulled myself together for the gig, like loads and loads and loads of paracetamol. And then that's why you, you might hear Peter go, Gemma's not been very well today. <laughs> because I was like, I'm not going to pull out on the gig. I'm not. I could play dying. But this may be the last gig that I ever play. <laughs> <laughs> oh so dramatic <laughs> uh, did you know it was being filmed like properly yeah, well yeah there was always some kind of person filming yeah at all times <laughs> like constantly um loads of people filmmakers interviewing mm. us I, I was just in for the ride like yeah talk to me there's a camera on me you know but that time there was a lot of camera crew um I didn't ask much about it. I didn't know that it was going to be for a DVD or anything. I just knew that there was a guy right next to my kit filming me all the time. <laughs> but um, yeah, that DVD did really well, I think. They released that and it did really well. It's a great, great video. I love that. Yeah, I actually paid to watch it last summer and then it was on there. I saw someone had uploaded it to YouTube in the last few months. <laughs> oh, damn. But no, it's, it's, it's I love it. And you were on there. Uh, go on, sorry. I own it. I bought one <laughs> yeah. when it was in HMV. Uh, oh, right. HMV. <laughs> yes. Because you're on the big uh, drum riser as well, aren't you? Is that something you did often or is it just like a one off? No, it's just whenever they were there in the venue. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen a drum riser like that before and I've never seen one since. But I was so happy. When we walked in, I was like, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> Can we take this on tour? <laughs> Huge, sparkly drum riser. Yeah. That's wicked. <laughs> um, yeah, you mentioned like filmmakers, and that. I just wanted to didn't really ask Patrick about um, the whole Max Carlish thing, but I guess was he just a face that was around that kind of faded into the background, really? Yeah. So when that documentary came out, um, I'd been asked to do an interview for it, and uh, yeah, I've got nothing to hide. I'll talk about anything. I love talking. <laughs> okay. um, and I gave my honest opinions I remember being asked what do you remember of him what did you think of him blah 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 no idea when the documentary actually came out I was watching it thinking wow I didn't see any of this like he was very obsessive and all the arguments of the punching and you know all the, the weird stuff that went on I never knew any of that was going on at the time. So in amongst all of this, is it cuts to me and I'm like, oh, I thought Max was a really nice man. Never, I thought, oh my God, I look so silly. But that's the truth. What I ever saw of Max, he was nice enough. He wasn't particularly interested in talking to any of us. He just wanted to talk to Peter, but that's generally what happened all the time. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We, we were just with Pete and there was a lot of people around us and Max yeah he didn't fade into the background but he was in the Pete's crew hmm. circle if you see <laughs> the bus in the dressing room I never really hung out on the dressing rooms much because I can't sit there and do my makeup or brush my hair or have a chat with the band because there's so many people there so yeah I never really talked very much to Max <laughs> but, yeah. but it makes for a quite an interesting documentary though <laughs> yeah yeah it's just good for uh 
just to see what it was like kind of backstage and stuff. And like you say, it's constantly just looked like a party on the road, yeah. It was, it was. <laughs> there was once we was playing in Belfast. Yeah, so we did Top of the Pops um, and we were leaving that night from Top of the Pops to go over to Ireland and play Belfast. And we played there and it was absolutely rammed, just rammed. And um, the bus was right along the back doors of the, va- of the venue. So the crew had done the loadout um, and I went into the dressing room to be with the band to say, okay, come on, we're, we're going through the crowd. Security are going to open the back doors and we're going to go on the bus and leave for our next gig. And <laughs> there was such a massive crowd of people out there that the, the security opened the doors, <laughs> the band went through, but because I'm little, <laughs> I always end up at the back. And I remember the crowd just closed behind me and I watched them get on the bus and I couldn't get through the crowd. Security weren't listening to me. I was like, excuse me, excuse me, I'm in the band. <laughs> and the doors shut on the bus and they drove off. And I was like, oh my God. I was like swallowed up in this crowd of about 60, 70 people shouting pee. And like, I just want to get on my on my bus. <laughs> You've all left me. Down. I had to ring one of the techs who banged on the driver's door and was like, we need to go back. <laughs> We've left Jeva. So I remember standing on the corner of the back by the back of the venue. Um, no one really noticed me. They all just sort of mizzled off. And then the bus came back around, the door opened, and I jumped in. <laughs> like, guys, can you make sure that every single time this bus is leaving, you just do a register and check that I'm on the bus? <laughs> yeah. Just the four men pay for you. <laughs> yes, we all know where everyone else is, but poor Gemma, she gets left behind. <laughs> Like, it was quite exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Patrick was saying there's a few close calls with police. Obviously, I imagine you weren't guilty of anything, but no. I guess they didn't, the police weren't really uh, being too particular about who they took away, I guess. No, do you know what? That was all just after I left. Oh, uh, right. So the press had got a hold of the Pete and Kate thing and they were all over the press um good bad and ugly all of it it was just constantly and um that was around the time that I left so I assume that after that um yeah they were higher profile Mm. Uh, you've got to have lived under a rock to not know (laughs) what kind of things you could find on the tour bus um so yeah all of that police kind of stuff happened after we had the police called to the stoke on trent venue once because they trashed it like the kid the fans trashed it. it was great that was really good fun as well <laughs> and they invited us back the next week so ah, it was all good but there was no arrest made there was no um violence or any of that there was one show in aberdeen that peter fell down the stairs on the bus and whether people believe that or not I swear to God, I saw it happen. We was about to go into the venue to go on stage. He turned around to speak to someone and just went like head first down them stairs. I don't know how he didn't crack open his skull, but it was all woozy. And we all said, you know, with his track record, people are going to think that we're wheeling out Peter when he's not well. And it actually genuinely was the truth. But there was a huge riot and they was police. The fans were rocking the bus, big, huge tour bus banging and smashing in windows. And there was loads of police called to that, that gig, but that wasn't to us. You know, it was just to calm the people. The police um, presence came after I left. So I didn't, uh, okay, right. I didn't witness too much of that stuff. <laughs> yeah, fair. Um, <laughs> You know, we asked Pat like, what it was like when, you know, with, with, there were times where Pete just wouldn't make the gig or whatever, and you, like, left with, like, the fans waiting for something to happen kind of thing. That is the worst feeling for me. Like, I'm such a music fan. I love I love music, live gigs. It's my favourite. But the, the worst one was the Astoria, obviously the Astoria, Um I'm trying to think because he, we did Blackpool. I remember Pete, uh, Patrick saying there was one gig he fell asleep on. I was, um, I was driving, listening to it and I was shouting, I was going, it was Blackpool, it was Blackpool. Um, yeah, it was Blackpool. 
so we started the set. As I told you, I never saw them before the gig. Uh, me and Drew started. Patrick came out, joined in, and Peter came out and was all like half asleep. And yeah, he literally fell asleep over my kit. I remember slapping him <laughs> harder than I planned. It was more of a joking kind of thing, but I actually clumped him one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he fell asleep and we tried to play a few songs, um, went off backstage for a bit of a regroup, like, what do we do? Um, but that gig was pulled. Um, and then the Astoria was the, the biggest one that he didn't turn up to. And I don't, do you know what? I don't think he did that to any others. I think we always did the gigs that were booked. That might just be my hazy memory mm. and my rose tinted spectacles, which I like to live my life with. <laughs> Everything's a positive, but they're the only two gigs that I can think of. And out okay. So you think that was more of a an, an enemy or media thing where it's like, will he turn up kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. There was always that question with me as well. I won't lie. I did always think, I mean, apart from when we was on a tour bus, because I've seen him, like I know he's asleep in that, that room. I know he's there. But the, the earlier days in the van, but again, we were traveling together. So yeah, I don't know. I never really worried too much, but when it did happen, that Astoria gig, oh my God, I just, I was crying more than, the biggest reason was just for the people. There was a, a fan called Fergie from Glasgow and he is a legend and I just thought the world of him. And I knew that he'd got the train down to come to it. And I knew he was down there because I'd spotted him from the balcony and I'd waved, all right, Fergie's down there. He's come all this way from Scotland. And it was just all the people down there that had made all the effort that really wanted to see us and they didn't get to see us. And us three were out the back, me, Pat and Drew. And I was begging them, why don't we let me go out? Let me go out and say, we're here. We genuinely don't know where he is. Look, I was young. <laughs> they treated me like little sister. Maybe they all knew where he was. I don't know. But I genuinely had no idea where he was that day. And to this day, I've heard conflicting stories of actually what had happened. But all I know is that I was there. And I was just heartbroken for everyone that had come all that way. Hmm. That was that, yeah, that was a horrible feeling. I didn't like that at all. Oh, yeah, <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, it was horrible. Um, I was watching an interview with you all backstage, I think at Brixton. Did he did he support Ronnie Wood? Yeah, that was a uh, Shepherd's Bush Empire. Uh, yeah. Shepherd's Bush, right. That is a great video. That yeah, I yeah. Mm. That kind of like. I don't know. It sums up how much fun you were having. I think everything seemed quite happy and friendly at that point. It was amazing. He did his, we are the baby shamble, shamble, yeah. living along. I love that. I always wanted to play that on stage, but Patrick wouldn't have it. <laughs> <laughs> He'd like sometimes join in and go, oh, shambling along. But I loved it. I'm young. I was young and I, everything was exciting. And like I said, I pinched myself on a daily basis. Like, is this happening? That day I did, um, I, I, not, I didn't do Ronnie Wood's makeup, but I was doing my makeup in the dressing room and the door opened. I thought it was one of the boys. He was like, all right, in the mirror. I was like, oh my God, it's Ronnie Wood. <laughs> doing my eyeshadow. And he was like, all right, darling, oh, let me have a go on that. So we was doing a makeup together. And I was like, <laughs> this is real. I'm like, what? And that was yes. the gig that Kate had come to see Peter. So right. I, I, I did some eyeliner for him, made him look all pretty. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that I love that interview. Like that, it's like a mini documentary thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah. Um, really cool. Obviously, you mentioned Kate Moss. So was that kind of like you say when it becomes a tabloidy type thing? Was that a bit of a catalyst for things getting a bit strange? I, for me, it was. Yeah, it, it wasn't Kate. Cause she was lovely. Like uh, there were so many people that hanging around. As long as I got to see the three boys, I was happy. Um, but yeah, the, the tabloids were just making him out to be this junky monster kind of thing. You know, all these horrible photos of him going on the front page and Kate's going out with this guy. And 
I felt very protective because I love them like my brothers. And I didn't like anyone saying horrible things, you know, but it just taken a turn. Um, it, it just felt out of control. The fun of it had sort of started to go. The gigs were getting bigger. The venues were bigger. There was talk of an album. And I just couldn't see that we were being steered in the right direction. I didn't see that we were being steered in any direction, to be honest, with the management. Um, and also sidelined, I just hated seeing the way that they were being portrayed, um, or us, not so much me and Lucky, but I just didn't like that tabloid mess that had started to build around the band. And um, like I said, I was, I was very young and I'd had a great time. And I felt that to go in and record the album when I was not 100% comfortable in all the directions, I just felt it was too much of a commitment to record the album and then change my mind about being in the band. Do you know what I mean? Does that make sense? No, yes, yeah, quite a sensible decision. Yeah. Well, a mature decision. I was, I was only young. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I just knew, I knew I didn't, I didn't feel, unless we had different management and yeah, I couldn't see it going in that way. And I felt, you know, I've had the most amazing time. I'd rather leave at the top rather than start to feel sour, let mm. the whole experience sour for me. Um, yeah. So that's why, I mean, it, it wasn't a quick decision and it certainly wasn't very easy because I love them so much. And being in a band is like a marriage and I've, I've never got over that, do you know what I mean? But it was right for me as a drummer and it worked out, do you know what I mean, for Adam, Adam took over. But, um, and then, but then you see, I saw them loads. I went to see him play and, as much as I was like, oh, where's a nice song? Oh, I love this song. Oh, when we did it. But it was great because then I could see see them as a fan rather than, you know, imagining to mm. work that well in the end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, just one more thing on that. Like I was reading the letter or the statement that you posted mm. that just said, um, like, the management that kind of Peter chose and you, th you thought was actually kind of destroying him and the band yeah. what, you've obviously kind of described what you meant but what did you really mean by that be careful <laughs> <laughs> like I said I didn't feel that the band was being looked after so you can a management could deflect or mold the stories that are going out or there was quite a lot of bad press and nothing to do with the music or Peter is the talent. It was more the circus. And I believe that we could have even taken a month to go and record the album, a month away, away from the press. Don't tell the press. You know, do you see what I mean? Like the, the, I believe that there was a way around the mess that, that was building. And I, I, I was on my own in those beliefs. Do you know what I mean? I, I did speak to the boys about it, the management, and um, I think, like I said, the, the spark kind of just started to wear off me and I could see a bigger picture that I wasn't 100% about being part of, if you see what I mean. So it was nothing against the boys, the music, the band, everything about that was it for me. I was in for the lifetime, but it's never like that. <laughs> There's always so much more going on around the band. And, um, but like I said, it worked out perfectly for everybody because Shambles went on and recorded the album and did some amazing gigs and tours and whatever. Um, and I continue playing and, and, you know, went back to the suffragettes and ha I've had a great time, but it could have been so different. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, if when I asked for questions, a few people did ask, you know, in hindsight, do you feel like you left at the right time or whatever? Yeah, yeah. I would have liked to have, have recorded the album to have put a year's worth of work into it and touring it and creating it. Like, I was there at the beginning. Um, I would have liked to, to now be able to look back on the album 
Um, and actually the only official recordings that I did was Kilimanjaro, A Man Who Came To Stay, um, but not the album, which is, is one, it's not a regret. I don't really like regrets. Um, I don't, I, I, I rather than regret, I look back and think I would have liked to have been on the album, um, but I didn't. And do you know what I mean? Everything happens for a reason. And uh, I, I still love them with all my heart. And I'm the biggest fan of Baby Showers because I still watch what we did constantly. I love it. Like it's great. <laughs> I can't believe that I did all of that stuff and we did all that. We achieved that. It was great. It was great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, move on to some questions then because you mentioned that Kilimanjaro recording and uh, Cole uh, on Instagram said, how was it working with Paul Epp with that single? That man is a legend. <laughs> he is. I would have pushed for him to do the album because he just got us. He got the band 100%. Um, we spent ages working on the drum sound. Um, he said that I was too nice at the intro, you know, the dun 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 of Kilimanjaro when we first played it. He was like, it's a great tune, but you need to hit the hell out of those drums. I was like, all righty then, you don't have to tell me twice. So, but we worked ages on that intro and um, he managed to harness a fantastic vocal track with, Pe with Peter. I still think that the, I think Matthew Man Who Came To Stay is one of his best vocal tracks I've ever heard him do. Fantastic. But that was at like five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> like it took a long time to get that moment. Paul Edward, such a good guy, such a lovely boat. And then he went on to just be this like global superstar, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. So cool. <laughs> But yeah, to, to now say, oh, I worked with Paul Epra, he was great. I've got some, there's some video footage of that recording time somewhere. I'm sure I've seen it on YouTube. Ah, uh, cool, yeah. Yeah, us not all messing about in the, in the control room. <laughs> yeah, but no, he, he, did, he did get some really good stuff, work out of us. Yeah, I think Patrick said he'd, you know, he'd like to have heard his version of the album, yeah. Yeah, oh, 100%. Yeah. He'd love to have, have worked that album with Paul. He was great. And then I think you've, you mentioned Fergie, didn't you? Uh, Fergie. From Glasgow. Yeah, do you know Fergie? <laughs> no, I'm just, he sent, they sent in a question. Has um, he? Oh, well, Fergie. <laughs> it's more of a, he's just saying that he's two, he's like the two gigs at Glasgow Garage and Barfly on the same night are up there with the best. And he said to say hi. <laughs> oh uh, my gosh. Yeah. Do you know what? I haven't actually spoken to Fergie it's probably since that day of the Astoria. The garage, <laughs> if I remember, was my birthday and they smashed some cupcakes in my face. And then <laughs> the crowd spent the rest of the set throwing it back at me. So I was like dodging cupcake missiles. <laughs> and then, yeah, we went to the bar fly after for an acoustic. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember because they, they bought me this really massive bottle of Jack Daniels. I love Jack Daniels. Um, they bought me a huge bottle, um, but I had no mixer. And like... I can't sink like drink that straight. Like I can't do it. But I was. And I felt so <laughs> cool. <laughs> I was like 20, like swinging from this fresh bottle of Jack. Oh, I'm yes. Oh, I'm gonna have to look for him on Instagram now. <laughs> yeah, the cut he's called uh, Great Escape Glasgow. I think he must put on gigs or something. Yeah. Uh, and then Glasgow again, Peacock Johnny says. Is Gemma's new band coming to Glasgow anytime soon? We will, fingers crossed. <laughs> We're getting to Preston, which is quite far up north, but it's not quite Glasgow. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell them, we'll book a gig. <laughs> we might need to sleep on your floor, though. <laughs> um, there's someone else, a lot of Glasgow topics. Uh, someone mentioned in that Byfly gig in Glasgow saying there's maybe some kind of riot of some sort. You know, I can't, like I said, I've got hazy memories. There was a lot of stage invasions. It could have been that. I don't remember there being an actual riot. <laughs> no, I don't think it was a riot, but it, it was a riot, if you see what I mean. It was yeah. chaos. There was people everywhere. It was wicked. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> was, it weird, uh, was it weird as well, like being an enemy every week? Was that quite surreal? Yeah, I made the cover. <laughs> I we knew that we were going to get a cover, but 
we'd posed the four of us mid set in Leeds. And um, I remember Patrick was like, Gem, it's you. I was like, what? What's me? And he was like, it's you and Peter on the cover of the NME. I was like, shut up, is it? He was like, yeah, not the band, you and Peter. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> oh, sorry, yay. But it's a sweaty, awful mid gig photo of us climbing over the, like this. I loved the enemy, and because I'd never managed to break in there properly with the suffragettes, I was like, check me out. They know my name. Come on. I was um, one of the quotes as well, and their end of the year rundown was um, some divvy smurf moment quote from Gemma about sitting downstairs on the bus watching Finding Nemo, eating bananas. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, or... Uh... I saw a picture where the caption was, "If you haven't got, don't come near me if you haven't got a banana or something." Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah if you ain't got a banana, you can fuck off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I did. I survived on tour on Golden Virginia roll ups, Volvic water, and bananas. <laughs> Love banana. Excellent. Um, Dirt Royale says, "Is there a song?" that never made it onto the Baby Shambles album that you were surprised didn't make it or that you thought should have made it? Yeah, we've just talked about this. Do You Know Me? Yeah, those songs, yeah. That is so good. Do You Know Me is a great song. I'm trying to think Clementine as well. I always love Clementine. I love you, but you're green. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. You actually did that a lot later, I think. You actually recorded that a lot later, properly. But I, always, I always really liked the acoustic version you did, yeah. Mm. There was another one that, mm, 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 mm. so I can play them. <laughs> I can yeah. talk drums to you, but I don't remember many of the lyrics. <laughs> I think in Manchester, you open with uh, Man Came to Stay, and it, was, it sounds ass. Yeah. Rare. I just used to like that, me and Drew just walk out like, one, two, three, four, blah. It's great. <laughs> it's a good set out now. Oh, I've gone on. Have you got the set list? Lost all these questions for some reason. One right. second. I wonder if you got the set list from Manchester. <laughs> I'm back to now. Uh, James Gillespie says, do you remember playing a gig at the Wrecking View pub in Telford? I think it was the fair, one of the first shambles gigs. Yes. It was like a beefy a pub or like Harvester or something. <laughs> Telford. <laughs> and then we played Shrewsbury as well. The Telford one, yeah. Because we were setting up, I remember setting up my kit in this corner and there was loads of like families eating their dinner. And I remember there was a family right there, like mom, dad and two kids. And the mum was like growling over at me from setting up a drum kit. And I was like, you might want to take your kids home, lady, because <laughs> it's going to go off in here. <laughs> and it did. There was pushing through to the, to the kit. Yeah, I remember Telford. Because there was like a drink shelf behind my head. And <laughs> oh my God. and the, the crowd were all pushing. And Patrick, it was, was trying to block me, but he lost his balance and fell on my kit, which pushed me backwards. And the shelf went into the back of my neck. And I was like, this is it. This is where I'm going to die. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That was like, yeah, a harvester or beefy or some like random place that should never have a band. And probably never has again after that experience. <laughs> God. Yeah, I remember, uh, obviously, talked quite a lot to the Paddingtons, and they, I think they played some strange place like that where everyone's just sat having a carvery. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? I love that. You've got to do them gigs. Like, I mean, how else could you? That's just brilliant. That is brilliant. <laughs> um, and yeah, just one last one to finish on then, Gemma, like, what was the high point of being in Baby Shambles? If there is something you can pick out, I don't know, yeah. Um, I just loved it all. And that's really, that's not what you want to hear, is it? <laughs> um, we've talked about all of the high points. Manchester Ritz was a really good gig. I really enjoyed that. I, I did Top of the Pops. Like, that has to be a high point. Right there. That has to be, like, really. No, it must be. I remember the uh, Radio X or XFM interview as well when um, Ian Camfield um, said, 
it was midweek and he said, your single is set to be number one if it wasn't for Bob Geldof releasing his Christmas band aid or something. And I remember hearing those words like, wow, like we're really doing this. This is really good. And I think we went number two in the end because of band aid or, or something. It was, but I remember those words, it's set to be number one. That could be a particular point, but definitely top of the pops. That's just <laughs> history. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, spot on. Um, yeah, and obviously you mentioned you tour like uh, there's a band on social media and everything. Yeah, JW Paris, it's free piece. It's kind of like indie grungy, sleazy indie, something like that. I don't mm. know. It's good. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, someone else also thought I better get the name. He said. Sean Seymour, what are the odds of the band getting back together at some point? <laughs> Do you know what? I am so up for a reunion. I am more up for it than ever. And I should probably pay it cool and go like, oh no, I don't know. No, I am so up for it. So up for it. It's got to be us four, the OGs, OG shambles. I'll have that set in a few days. And can you imagine? That would be it, is that? I would be well up for it. A hundred percent. And I've said it actually weirdly to Patrick and to Drew um, in the last few months. Um, Cause I've, I've come out of my mum haze. My, my children are a little bit older now and can deal with me um, going off and rehearsing and playing gigs and stuff. Cause they can watch it on the telly or like on YouTube. I mean, put YouTube on the telly. And, they can <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, so now I'm back and I'm, full of all the excitement again and uh talking about this that whole era i would go back to that in a flash like come on if you're listening i'm up for it <laughs> our drum calluses are back <laughs> yes. i'd absolutely love to see you play just do that manchester gig like song for song again to be oh mega my God. Yeah. Oh, i could do that <laughs> <laughs> i totally could yeah, oh, yeah. No, i might have to listen to it i'll go have to watch that now yeah, it's definitely on YouTube. I was watching it today. That's so. my memory. <laughs> right, Gemma, I mean, that's that's it. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, so. you're great. Oh, I really enjoyed this too. <laughs> I like to talk. Can you tell? <laughs> no, some people like, you know, you're, you're in, I'm into bands more than other bands, but this one's been like, that was my kind of thing. So, good. Um, Did you go to see us ever? Did you see us? Um, I, You played in Hull, where I was from. But oh. I, I wasn't uh Hull. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. I remember that with the Paddingtons. That's all I remember being told is oh. all. <laughs> Where are you from? Oh. <laughs> but I was a bit too well. I knew people that went, but um I was only about 16. I'm trying to think, where did I play in Hull? Played at the Willie, I think. Yeah. So there would have been with the Paddingtons, yeah. Yeah, that's it. <clears throat> like a pub halfway on the road like is it a pub uh, it's like it, there's a pub next to it yeah but it's like halfway down um, main road yeah yeah I do remember that I just remember the Adelphi I played there oh, like right. 7,000 times with the suffragettes oh uh, cool right and that's down a really narrow road isn't it yeah yeah it's down I used to live down there the grey street yeah yeah all, all the cars <laughs> parked up side to side yeah 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 I remember that oh that's cool you must, do you see, did the Paladins come to those gigs or anything? No, Maybe. do you know what? what? Have I been to their recent? No, I mean, like, when you played Hall with Suffragettes, I wonder if... No, not after. No, because, not like I kept saying, Suffragettes were a different... Yeah, scene. yeah. We got a lot of um, press, like, and, and it started to get a bit embarrassing. Like, I felt bad on the other girls, like, would turn up to venues and, like, on chalkboards outside and say, Gemma from Baby Showers. I'm like... These people need to do their research because the Peter fans are not going to get this. <laughs> we weren't <laughs> screamy metal in any way. It was quite commercial, but it certainly wasn't jangly indie and, you know, poetic chaos. Yeah. yeah. That. But um, no, I don't think the Paddingtons came to see us after that. Nah, they it. played not long ago in London, did they? The Macbeth. Uh, yeah, yeah. And then the last time I saw them, 
was it um, near London Field and Patrick who went went to that I think. Which, yeah. But I didn't know. But uh, yeah, I think I it's, it's a bit of like now it's now twenty years ago and people have started to like reform it, haven't they? <laughs> yeah, oh, 20 years. Do you know what shambles is? 18 years. Yeah, yeah, 20-year reunion, isn't it, I reckon? Yeah, but I want to do it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'd like <laughs> to say it now, yeah. We're doing 18 and a 20. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's a winner. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I suppose yeah. one last uh, semi-serious question. It's obviously good to see Peter and Patrick on, like, a, a different path now in terms of being healthy and all that. Yeah. Yeah, incredible. And like I said, I, I knew that Patrick has, has been doing so well, but I didn't realise, because I haven't seen him or spoke to him properly, until I heard your interview with him. And it choked me up, because I had no idea that he had got that bad. And um, he was very close with my family. And it was just a bit gutting to think that he'd gone through all of that without me or my dad with him. It was just heartbreaking. But as well with Peter, like, you know, people take the jokes out of him, call him, you know, because he's so fat. But I think it's fantastic because it, it means he's clean. And same with Patrick. I've always said the same thing. Whenever they're fat, you know they're doing good. <laughs> I'd rather see them fat than skeletal again because they're healthy. You know, you can lose a bit of weight. Shaking a drug habit is a little bit more difficult. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. <laughs> right, Spawn Jim, I'll let you go off, but I really appreciate that. We're going to play my drums. Oh, okay, really nice. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. Let yeah, me know great. if it's out and I'll do some sharing. Yeah, cool. I'll try probably by the end of the week, but yeah, I'll let you know what the crack is. Good luck editing all that. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> I mean, you can do it tally, right? How many times do I giggle and say, oh my God? <laughs> I want to count at the end. <laughs> that was fun. You're a legend. I don't even know how to work this laptop. Thank you so much. No worries. Cheers, Gemma. Take, Take care. care.